Okay, so this video is going to be your lab prep for the Group 2 Metal Lab. And unfortunately, since I haven't been able to be on campus to do this lab, you're going to have somebody else showing you how to do this uh, via YouTube. So I apologize for that. You know, I tried to make all of my videos me to make it more um, graspable. So anyways, so let's talk about this lab. So first of all, let's talk about what we have learned over the past week and a half. So what do we know? Okay, so we first know that as you move down the group in a periodic table, your atom gets larger, right? Because you're adding more and more energy levels, okay? So if we're looking here, the two metals that we're going to be looking at is magnesium and calcium, right? So you see magnesium only has three energy levels and calcium is the bigger atom because it has four energy levels. We also know that as you move down a group, the ionization energy, so the ability of an electron to be moved off of an atom, gets smaller, right? So let's think about what this means for us. So these two electrons right here are the two electrons that are going to be doing chemistry because they're the outermost electrons. So why is calcium's ionization energy smaller. So why is the amount of energy to remove those two electrons smaller? It's because those electrons are further away from the positively centered nucleus. So it becomes much easier to remove them. So those two chemicals can do chemistry. So I think I just kind of explained it, but let's look at it again. Okay. So as you increase levels, as you go down, the outermost electron gets further from the positive core of the nucleus, making it easier to pluck off those electrons. And those are the electrons that actually do chemistry. They are the ones that react. Okay, so what's the purpose of this lab? Well, the purpose of this lab is that we are going to observe both of those trends of the periodic table. So we're going to view the reaction of two group two metals, magnesium and calcium, and we're going to observe their reactivity with water. The concepts that we are going to be covering are the trends of the periodic table, atom size, ionization energy, and reactivity. So our procedure. So this procedure is pretty straightforward, so let's just walk through this. The first thing we're gonna do is clean the magnesium metal with a wire brush. This is because magnesium can react with the oxygen in the air. So what you have to do is scrape off of that magnesium oxide. So um, you can just strictly get Mg. And then we're gonna drop the magnesium into the water and record observations. So we're gonna record initial observations here. And then we're going to add a few drops of this thing called phenolphthalein, and he explains it a little bit in, t in the video. But what happens is phenolphthalein is clear when it's under acidic conditions, meaning pH less than 7, and it turns pink under basic conditions, so pH greater than 7. And the, I don't really need you to understand that right now. We'll eventually talk about that at the end of the year. But what I do want you to realize is that phenolphthalein indicates to us that a chemical reaction has changed, right? So if it stays pink, if it stays clear, that means no chemical reaction has changed because we're just indicating the um, pH of water. If it does turn pink, then that tells us a chemical reaction has taken place because we're creating a new substance to make it pink. And then we're going to record observations. And then we're going to see that since this reaction is so slow, we're going to have to heat it over the Bunsen burner to speed it up. And he talks about why that is. It's because we're making the molecules move faster and interact with each other more. And that's why the reaction can go faster once heated. And then we're going to record observations. Okay, the second part of the procedure is um, calcium. So the first thing that you're going to see is a water displacement test tube as shown before. So what's going to happen here is we're going to react the calcium with water here, and the gas that forms is going to go up through this tube into the water, and what's going to happen is the, the gas is going to go up and push water out, and you'll start to see them separate, and what is in the test tube is the gas that's actually being produced over here. And then we're going to add calcium to the test tube, cover with a rubber stopper, and then record observations. And then what's going to happen is they're going to flame test the gas in the test tube. 
Um, he's going to explain if carbon, if the gas that we're creating is carbon dioxide, it would just be put out, right? Because carbon dioxide does is not um, does not enhance fire. Oxygen does. Where if oxygen is what's being formed, if we put the flame over top of the test tube, the test tube will catch fire. Um, the, the rim of the test tube will catch fire. If it's hydrogen gas, hydrogen has this really, it, it reacts pretty readily with fire, right? And it makes up pop noise when it, when it reacts with fire. And then we're gonna record observations. This is what your data table is gonna look like. Since in our procedure, the only data that we're collecting are our observations, that's all that you have to collect for this lab. So what is our data analysis gonna look like? So I want you to think about this. Ultimately, we are recording H2 that's being produced for each chemical reaction. So when magnesium reacts with water, it makes this thing called MgO, which is magnesium oxide and hydrogen gas. And then for calcium, it's the same reaction, except you're making calcium oxide and hydrogen gas. So the question is, who makes more H2 faster, right? And then that's telling us who is more reactive. And then lastly, um, you need to make sure you have your conclusion. The purpose of this lab was, I achieved this purpose by, and two possible sources of error were. Awesome, thanks y'all.